This, this is the day that the Lord has made. Oh, it is wonderful to see us all here today. Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, the sermon title today, In the Midst of uh, Chaos, Christ is There. Christ is in the midst of chaos. So whether uh, you did it, you made it to church at a different time. So pat yourselves on the back, take a deep breath and arrive. It is wonderful to see friends. It is wonderful to see some folks we haven't seen for a while. It's wonderful for the 845 and the 11 o'clock congregations to come together. Uh, It is just uh, a good and glorious day. Uh, want to have several announcements and, uh, and then we'll get into the service. Um, first, this is the beginning of Holy Week, the last week of Lent. And during Holy Week, we remember not just Palm Sunday, uh, and you'll hear much more about Palm Sunday today, but also we will have a Maundy Thursday service at 7 o'clock in the chapel on Thursday, which celebrates and remembers the Last Supper. And also we will have, as part of that service, uh, an opportunity to wash one another's hands. Uh, You might have heard of foot washing services before, and uh, we just don't wash one another's feet very often. So uh, we'll take a step uh, towards that and uh, participate, if you'd like, in a hand washing uh, uh, service of humility and service and hospitality toward one another. On Easter morning, you were invited at 7 o'clock a.m. to Merritt Commons for an ecumenical uh, Easter sunrise service. Merritt Commons is the gazebo that's down across the street from Roxborough Baptist, and we'll be joined uh, with Roxborough Baptist and Roxborough Presbyterian Church on that morning. That's 7 o'clock Easter morning next Sunday. And then we have one service on Easter Sunday morning as well, and that is at 1030 Uh, also. So 10.30 next Sunday, I hope that you can come and attend. Uh, A little bit sooner than that, today, immediately following this service, we have a luncheon put on by the United Women of Faith, and uh, you are all welcome to attend and to participate and fellowship. And following that luncheon, there's an Easter egg hunt for uh, our little ones, and so uh, we, that is always a joyful time. So please join us uh, for that. Next week on Easter Sunday, we, we uh, have a tradition of a flower cross. So if you have flowers in your yard, some beautiful whatevers they are that I can never remember, please bring those uh, and uh, they will be incorporated in the service. And uh, children, if they want to participate in that, should be here before the service begins. Uh, Coming up a little bit later, there are two wedding showers in our future. April 7th, we will be honoring and celebrating uh, our intern, Slice Penny, and his fiancée, Julie Pagel, uh, and having a shower for them. And then also uh, for Mary Kelsey Wren and her fiancée, Josh Jackson, that will be April 14th. So please mark your calendars uh, for those two important uh, moments. Administratively, we have uh, a few things that I want to tell you about. One, our fun day is coming up, and uh, there are that is a fundraiser to help us with our capital uh, debts. We are uh, selling tickets today. They'll be available for the meal part of fun day. They'll be available in uh, at the uh, luncheon. We also are looking for uh, donations and the, the uh, envelopes that have been decorated by our United Methodist Youth. You can use those for that kind of fun. You could also take one of those home and bring back a different kind of envelope and then you have a keepsake if you'd like. But you can uh, make those fun day contributions today or next Sunday. Um, <clears throat> we are in need of... Uh, silent auction items. And that is one of the fundraising elements of Fun Day. Uh, There will be some already. We've had donated some weeks at the beach. Uh, Also uh, some other items. Maybe acts of service of some kind or things that aren't as tangible might be something that you could donate and help us to uh, raise money for uh, for our church. Um, 
I wanted to make a couple of announcements just briefly here. One, we have received again, we got word this week that we received the grant from the Duke Endowment for the summer literacy camp again. So praise God, we're happy for that and uh, we'll need lots and lots of help. It's a community-wide effort. Uh, last year we served 36 kids and we look forward to being able to serve uh, a number of kids also uh, 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 in the future, this coming uh, summer. And lastly, an announcement, if you're listening in the nursery, uh, we are excited to have, beginning today, two new nursery workers that we have hired, Sherry Clayton, uh, and one uh, who, who has been with our preschool, uh, she's worked there some, but also uh, uh, Kayla Brown, who is a granddaughter and was raised up in this church. And so the two of them begin today serving our littlest ones uh, in the nursery. So please uh, congratulate them. Thank them for their service uh, to us. We're really excited for that. Last announcement for the luncheon. In order for us to transition from this service to that, I'm going to go ahead. I think the blessing will still hold if I make it this early. We're going to bless the food. Uh, and so, God, we thank you for the wonderful aroma wafting up from uh, the fellowship hall today. We thank you for uh, the service of those who are providing that food for us. We thank you for the fellowship that will occur, for the joy of the children at our Easter egg hunt. We just give you all thanks and praise. We thank you for the long legacy of women who have served in this church and who offer themselves again in service today. Uh, we ask that you would bless the food to the good of our bodies and bless our bodies to the good of your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with our worship, and it begins a little bit differently. I'll let Slice kind of lead us through that, uh, and then uh, uh, we will have the procession of the palms during our first hymn. Hear now from the gospel according to Mark how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem, followed by a response that you will join me in. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied to a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And now I invite you to stand in body or spirit as you're able as we sing together our opening hymn, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, number 278 in your hymn.
Almighty God, on this day, your Son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed King by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. And now let us join together in professing our faith using the words from page 889 of your hymnal. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world.
Now, the children are doing lots of marching in this parade, and we will now dismiss our children to Children's Church. Thank you, you have, who have been a part of probably Roxborough, Person County's largest choir today. Uh, thank you for singing. You made the world a beautiful place. Let us sing the song. Uh, we sang it as an entrance. We're going to sing it again as we uh, usher the children out. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children say, through those moving parts. Thank God there were no emergencies. Uh, there would have been an emergency if, uh, if Chuck had invited probably Chuck, uh, uh, Slice and myself to play the bells along with them. That would have been an emergency. Or to do a tenor solo perhaps. That would have been an emergency. But there were no emergencies. There was no chaos. You pulled that off beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This past week, speaking of emergencies, uh, about a dozen or so of our church friends got together to talk about being prepared in the, event, in the event of an emergency here in our building or on the grounds. You know, it's important to do that. That's why I can remember as a kid doing tornado drills or fire drills in the schools. So we got together and uh, we talked about what, how we would respond if, uh, God forbid, a fire might break out or a person was threatening harm or, or uh, there was a medical emergency. I'm sure it would be quite chaotic. Human nature being what it is, some folks would probably freeze like a deer in the headlights, right? Others might panic and make a mad rush for the nearest door. But a few people who have been trained or who act with calm and wise authority and assertion could help us in the midst of that chaos usher others to safety. They could act as the life-saving peace of Christ in the midst of chaos. We never want it to happen. But the news stories of our world remind us daily that there is chaos in our world. It is a part of our world. Two years ago, Russia invaded Ukraine. Four years and two weeks ago, our church services as we knew them halted so that we could figure out a response to this new coronavirus that had begun sweeping the globe. Indeed, today marks the anniversary of the assassination of Bishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador while he was presiding over communion, over mass at his church in El Salvador. That, can you imagine the chaos of a great leader in his country and for the world uh, being shot down in the midst of the most holiest occasions? And in his memory, uh, I offer this quote from him. He says... Uh, Bishop Romero said, it helps now and then to step back and take the long view. He says, the kingdom of God is not only beyond our efforts, it's even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is the Lord's work. Nothing we do is complete. Nothing. Nothing we do it's another way of saying that the kingdom of God always lies beyond us. There is no sermon that says all that needs to be said. There is no prayer that fully expresses our faith. There is no confession that brings utter perfection. There is no pastoral visit which brings total wholeness. There's no program that accomplishes the church's mission. There's no set of goals and objectives that includes everything. That is what we are about. We just plant the seeds that one day will grow. And sometimes we're blessed to water seeds already planted, knowing they hold future promise. 
That's a reminder, I think, that Christ is present in the chaos and in our finitude, in our limitations. And the seeds of our service grow into something beautiful because they are watered and grown by God's grace. So today in the church year, with the children processing in, with the palms up on the altar. We remember the parade day, really, on which Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly. There were crowds proclaiming Jesus, Messiah and King. It starts as a triumphal entry. People waving palm branches, lay at which we remember today. But also, it says in the Bible, people took their own coats off, their cloaks off, and laid them on the road in order for that dirty, dusty donkey to trample upon. I didn't see any of you doing that this morning, and I didn't do it, didn't do it either. They shouted, Hosanna. But today, while we began with this triumphant parade, we will end remembering that Sunday's poems are saved and dry and used for next year's ashes of Ash Wednesday. It didn't last long, this parade, this this jubilation, this this triumphant entry. Uh, It is a reminder today that the way of Christ's triumph runs straight to and through the cross. But nonetheless, we have begun our day in celebration. For our King of Kings arrives but not the way kings usually arrive. Reverend King Duncan, in his collected work, says that the Greek author, ancient author, Plutarch, described how kings are supposed to enter a city. He tells about one Roman general, Aemilius Paulus, who won a decisive victory over the Macedonians. When Aemilius returned to Rome triumphant, his procession lasted three days of display and marching in the plunder to show what a great king and general he was. After three days, then came the captured and humiliated king of Macedonia, along with his extended family in chains. And finally, Aemilius himself entered Rome, mounted on a magnificent chariot. He was accompanied by a large choir singing hymns, praising the military accomplishments of the great Aemilius. That, my friends, is how a king is supposed to enter a city. But the king of kings, our king of kings, he entered riding on a lowly donkey. This is Christ, our king, in the midst of the world's chaos. Which leads up to today's passage that has Jesus, I'm sorry, the lead up to today's passage, that triumphal entry. Before that happened, in the very previous chapter, Mark chapter 10, we see that Jesus is approaching Jerusalem for today. And context matters when you are in the midst of chaos. The lead up to what we remember and celebrate today was filled with things that seemed all topsy-turvy, all upside down. You would think that any prince about to enter his reign would do regal things, kingly things. Design the robes, arrange the parade, put the plunder on promenade, all for the power and prestige, but not Jesus, not our king. For Jesus, in the chapter before our scripture today, is making his way to Jerusalem. And if you were to read through it in chapter 10, first the little children try to come to Jesus, but the disciples rebuke them. Children are to be seen and not heard, they say, and they have nothing to offer, say the disciples. So away with them, the disciples say. But Jesus says, let the little children come to me, saying we all need to be like little children in our faith because the kingdom belongs to such as these. And Jesus, as he does this and says that about the children, is not just shaking hands and glad-handing and kissing babies like a politician. He's not doing that. He is pronouncing value and worth on the world's most vulnerable. That's the way of King Jesus. And then a rich man, a very wealthy man, comes and asks Jesus how to gain eternal life. Now this is the kind of guy that could really help a king. Uh, The kind of guy that a king would want in his corner 
right? With all his power and wealth, the ability to fund campaigns and, and live life, a life of luxury. Lord knows folks who have money and property provide lots and lots of influence. This guy, furthermore, is a good guy. He's kept all the commandments since he was a boy. But Jesus tells him, this king, Jesus, tells him that he lacks one thing, to go and sell everything he has and give the proceeds to the poor and then to follow him with nothing except himself to offer. And the man who has much wealth went away sad. Jesus said, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. This king of ours that made his triumphal entry said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for one of those to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not making promises to the powerful. He's not letting you pay to play, so to speak. He's saying that the kingdom he reigns over requires you to come in offering nothing but yourself in order to serve at the absolute lowest level. But the disciples don't get it. It's the way of Christ the King. Even if it takes us millennium to comprehend, And I'm not sure that we get it either. And then, in this context, the very next thing that happened is that Jesus' own disciples, James and John, asked Jesus to sit at his right hand in glory, to have heavenly power. And Jesus says, hey, those seats aren't for me to give. The other followers, the disciples, get angry with James and John, saying, basically, you knuckleheads. And Jesus stops the brawling and the petty argument and says to them, look, whoever wants to be great must be the servant of all. The Son of Man came to serve, not to to be served. Even the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the way of Christ the King, the way of crucifixion in the midst of chaos. And then, in the very last story, before today's triumphal entry, Jesus enters Jericho. Jerusalem to Jericho, the road is about 18 miles long. The Jericho road, the one that Jesus is on when he gets to Jericho, is the one that served as the setting for the Good Samaritan story. It's a dangerous road. That's where the man got mugged and left for dead, and it was a, a Samaritan that came and helped him. Anyway, You'd be nervous walking that road. Your senses would be peaked. Your head would be on a swivel, aware of shadows and bushes and places where you could be ambushed, where robbers could be hiding. That's the road Christ the King made his approach to Jerusalem on, not with a column of centurions and soldiers, but with misfits and fishermen and formerly crippled people. And while they're there in Jericho, a scant 18 miles from Jerusalem, A very noisy, cantankerous blind man hears that Jesus is passing by. And he calls out to Jesus, and he's disruptive, and he's rude, and he is shushed by Jesus' followers. But the more they shush him, the louder and more annoying he gets. Jesus invites him to come near. And the disciples kind of snidely say, it's your lucky day, blind man. And Jesus says, what is it you want? The man says, I'd like to see. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. And instantly, the blind man receives his sight and follows Jesus down the road. This cantankerous, rude man becomes one of Jesus' followers. And Jesus continues on the path that's set before him. That's the way of Christ, our King, welcoming the ones who have been difficult to welcome and love. And the last thing, you see, you see, the last thing that happens before Jesus rides in as a king is that Jesus welcomes a noisy, brash, belligerent, blind beggar into his band of followers. Jesus enables someone who is without sight to see. That's the kind of king that we follow. That's the Christ who comes in the midst of chaos. Christ, the healer. The children come 
too chaotic and not kingly enough. And Jesus says, we must all be like these, that the kingdom of God is theirs. The courting happens, asking for special favors and special friends. But Jesus says, we must seek out the lowliest service to be great. The condemnation follows. Look at them. They're so foolish. We're better than them. But Jesus says, we are all complicit and to stop judging and get busy serving our neighbors. That's Jesus the king's kind of kingdom. And then there's the chaotic clamor of God's blind children that rings out, unrefined by the disciples' standards. And it's the church folks that try to shush them. Be quiet. We don't follow Jesus that way. The man yells all the louder. How rude. But Jesus welcomes the blind, engages him, asks him what it is he's seeking, receives an honest answer. I just want to see. And I hear echoing in my ears, I just want some bread. I just want a job. I just want my chronic pain to go away. I just want enough to live on. I just want someone to listen. I just want a little bit of love. And Jesus gives his desire. And he follows Jesus. It wasn't all chaos. It was just a person in need of love and attention and care like you and me and all of God's children. In the midst of the chaos, Christ. That's what leads up to the triumphal entry. So Jesus was getting ready to enter Jerusalem. He didn't have a great chariot like General Aemilius Paulus. He didn't even have a horse or a donkey of his own. But there are plenty of donkeys already in the world. Go on ahead, Jesus said, and find the colt that God has provided. The Lord has need of it, and we're just going to borrow it, and you'll get it back shortly. In the chaos of scarcity... Jesus wants his disciples to know that enough has been provided already by God. Worry not about what you will eat or drink or wear, or in this case, ride. The Lord knows what you need. It might be in the possession of someone else. Perhaps they will be moved to share because the Lord indeed has need of what he has provided. So someday it might happen. We might be thinking back to the beginning of the, the sermon. We might have an emergency here, right in this building. I hope not, but accidents and emergencies do happen. In fact, the more you walk with folks whose lives are somewhat chaotic, the more likely accidents and emergencies are bound to happen. Some of us have the character traits to love and serve others in the midst of chaos, to help our friends know what to do. Maybe they will take charge and say, well, you call 911 and you go out and direct the ambulance here and you help folks make their way out to safety and you run and get the automated emergency defibrillator and you pray. The Lord has need of all of our gifts during chaos. Over the centuries, more than one person has come through the doors of our church or the church because they thought they would find their fortune. They might have thought, I'll get clients if I go to that church. I'll get, uh, I'll be able to win my election if I can rub elbows with those folks. I'll get a good word in with this leader or that leader, they think. Or maybe they or you think, my grandma will be happy if I show up at church today. Or maybe you even think, I'll find a cute boyfriend there. I actually think God smiles at our reasons, any and all of those reasons. But then God elbows the angels in my imagination and says, watch this. They thought whatever they thought in order to get within those walls. But now that they can hear the gospel, watch this. Watch their life be transformed. That person doesn't know what kind of grace is coming. They're going to learn who I've created them to be. They've been striving for the things of the world, but I need my church to show them the ways of the kingdom. They will lose themselves only to find their true gifts, the love that grants peace in the midst of the world's chaos. I don't know why you came, but I hope you come back. Christ in the midst of chaos. Christ in the midst of emergency. Christ wants to come into your heart to drive out the chaos and fill it with love. Christ can come into your mind with its worried thoughts and sleepless nights and fill that troubled mind with centeredness 
and peace and wholeness, contentedness and charity and clarity for what is good and just. Christ wants to come as king into your job and your pastimes to show you what is meaningful and release you from that which is destructive or self-serving or addictive. You can be set free by the power of Christ. You can be set free from your chaos. Christ wants to come triumphantly into your heart as he rode into Jerusalem long ago, humbly on an ordinary colt that he borrowed as he trampled over the palm branches that we see before us. Christ wants to come and quiet the chaos. I wonder, will you welcome him? This morning we remember that Christ comes in the midst of chaos, globally, locally, personally. This morning we remember the journey of Holy Week, that what started as a triumphant entry turned quickly to become the Last Supper, the humble washing of feet, the praying so fervently in the garden that Jesus sweat blood, the betrayal, the arrest, the torture, the carrying of the cross to the hill of his crucifixion, the denial by our frail human brothers, the death. We remember the stripping of the altar, the tending to a corpse by Jesus' closest followers. That's what awaits us when we choose to follow When we follow Jesus, it's not parades and glory. It's washing dirt off of feet and soiled hands. It's serving meals to ungrateful people. It's loving kids who are lost and acting out. It's forgiving belligerent desperados. It's chaotic. But that's the Christ we are following and his way. Christ is present with us and in us bringing wholeness and love in the midst of chaos, whether we are celebrating in chorus or crying at the foot of the cross. Christ is with us and in us in the chaos of the world. Christ is in the midst of chaos. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. we come to our time of prayer, we remember those, especially within our congregation, Uh, we remember Tom Hill Clayton, who is uh, struggling to get through his COVID and other respiratory illnesses. Uh, We pray for him and for his family. We also pray for Helen Starr as she is recovering from her broken ankle at home. Our deepest sympathy continues to be extended to Kyle Gilbert and his family in the death of his grandmother, Sylvia Fox Hill. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give thanks for nursery workers and we give thanks for Autumn Gentry, whose birthday is today. I hope you'll take a moment and uh, celebrate with her. We're so blessed to have her with us. We give thanks for uh, our youth who offer their service in dance and music and speech and, and voice and just their very presence in the world. We thank God for the children in our midst for the joy and the the meaningful ministry that has come through our intern, Slice Penny. We thank God for relationships and for the technology that can connect us, for patience and hope while we wait for solutions and, and, uh, and, and remedies, even those which are a long time coming. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others that we would lift up in prayer this morning? I invite you to call out a name uh, that we can join together. Anthony, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes.
We thank and praise God for the volunteers for Backpack Pals who serve joyfully uh, and who donate uh, and help the over 350 kids every week during the school year to, be, uh, to have some food for the weekend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anyone else have a prayer request? Gracious God, we thank you for, um, for being our king, for being patient with us, for speaking your living word into our hearts in a way that we don't just hear, but we come to understand. And, and not just understand, but we come to believe. And, and not just to believe, but we come to allow our lives to be transformed by your good news. God, when we get it wrong... And we sin against you or our neighbor or even ourselves, we pray and thank you for forgiveness and for your grace that leads us back to you. God, we thank you for giving us eyes to see opportunities to serve our neighbors and for the humility to receive the help when we need it ourselves. We thank you for continuing to transform us into your family, to bring us ever closer We thank you that you gave yourself for us so that we might know you. And we pray that we would be truly united. And hear us now, O God, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd invite now the ushers to come forward as we worship God in tithes and offerings.
We dedicate these offerings to the proclamation of your word, the teaching of your ways, and the living of your will for all humankind. We reach out with joy and gladness to offer your love to the world. May these gifts enable the sharing of your presence with many who have not experienced a sense of their own value as your children. As we keep covenant with you, we would also share your promises with our neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to remain standing as you are able as we sing together our closing hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross, which is found on page 301 of your hymnal. highest and most significant days uh, within the church's year. 
I pray that you will go from this place mindful of God's sacrificial love for you, of the healing power of God, of God within you, not just around you and with you, but within you. Go in Christ's love. In Jesus' name, amen. And I would invite you to be seated now for a special choral benediction. And following that, we will uh, dismiss appropriately. Thank you.